this nationalism that uh, they are propagating the in the new of territorial nationalism and bharat version how is that going to affect us as to well i so, think uh, can you just put that in context with some of the debates you had when the universities were set up what mm -hmm. were the debates like yeah. can you just also contextualize the current scenario with some of the debates you had in your older days oh, when universities right. were being right. set up so you're asking me two questions mm -hmm. um when the when the universities well when when jnu was set up uh maybe i should answer it by explaining to you why did i leave delhi university and join jnu jnu was brand new there was nothing there and all i got was an invitation saying would you like to come and join us and i thought about it very hard and finally decided yes and and why did i decide yes because we had tried for the seven years that i was at delhi university we had tried a whole bunch of us there very hard to change the history syllabus which was essentially political and diplomatic history and we kept saying that you know there is now this is the 1960s i'm talking about there is now we said a new kind of history which is being taught all over the world which is social and economic history oh they said that's marxist we can't have marxist history and we tried our best with sit-ins and teach-ins and discussions i remember room number 22 in the faculty of arts building which used to be the place where everybody gathered for these discussions and we had endless discussions on what is actually meant by social and economic history it's not marxist history it's a different kind of history and so on um but we lost the battle in those days now of course delhi university's history syllabus is great but in those days it was stuck there so one joined jnu and when one joined jnu the most exciting thing about joining jnu for me at least was that there was a bunch of about 8 or 10 of us who were initially appointed and we were told make up a syllabus for an ma in history which doesn't repeat anything that said in any indian university syllabus so we had an absolutely clear hand to sit there and invent courses and we really enjoyed ourselves enormously we brainstormed like mad from morning till evening and you know um absolutely pitched into each other and said no no what you're talking about is nonsense and then someone else would come up and so on and we finally worked this thing out why did we do this for two reasons one is the strictly academic reason that every discipline changes course and you cannot have a discipline taught the same way as it was taught 30 or 40 years ago and i think now also the jnu disciplines are up for change because it's been a long time why is there change it's not just because it's fashionable knowledge changes and if your discipline is actually reaching out to knowledge and trying to see what is existing knowledge and how it can be advanced then you obviously have to change the courses so that was done the second thing was that we were very concerned about the fact that this was not two decades after independence and we were very concerned about the kinds of students that we were going to get the kinds of thinking that we could, were going to encourage among students and absolutely the essential quality of this thinking was that it had to be autonomous it had to be critical it had to be an absolutely free debate and so we did things like we would walk i remember walking into class one day at uh, the, the beginning of of classes and saying quite normally that you know if you have any problems with what i'm saying whether you agree with me or disagree with me or you don't understand me or whatever it is stop me and we'll talk about it and of course for the first three weeks nobody but nobody stopped me or anybody else amongst the faculty and then slowly you would have a hand going up and saying i'm not sure that i understood what you said you see so you would explain it again and then someone else would say but uh, i don't think i agree with that you see so then there would be a little discussion and we finally ended up with two hour lectures where part of it was the teacher teaching and much of it was open discussion 
Now that open discussion was absolutely fundamental because not only was, a, was it a comment on the courses that we were teaching, which is absolutely necessary, you've got to have student reactions, uh, but it was also a way of forcing students to think and forcing the th teachers to think as well. I mean, sometimes there would be very awkward questions and I would have to say, well, I'm sorry, I can't give you an answer. I'll give you an answer two days hence when we meet. And I would go back home and sort of look up books and talk to people and so on and then go back with an answer. Now, this process of interaction, of intellectual interaction, is absolutely fundamental to any university that is pretending to be a good university. There's no question, there's absolutely no question. So all the attacks that are taking place these days, interestingly, largely on social sciences and humanities, uh, not on the sciences, because partly I suppose most people uh, don't really understand the sciences. <laughs> it is very specialized knowledge. And partly because there is this feeling that, oh, the sciences and management studies are all right, because that's part of economic development. But humanities and social sciences, they're just creating mischief. They're always attacking. They don't understand that the social sciences, particularly, are at the root of all knowledge, because they're asking questions. The social sciences are teaching you how to become people who understand critical inquiry. And critical inquiry is the root of knowledge. You cannot have knowledge unless you ask the question, why, how, when? Questioning is fundamental. I mean, for, for ministers to get up and say that you mustn't ask questions, this is the most ridiculous thing I've heard in years. Uh, you cannot say that. You've got to ask questions and, and you've got to have one space in your society, at least, at least one space in which anybody can get up and ask any question and start a discussion. And maybe that person will be shouted down and will be told, no, no, you're talking absolute nonsense. Maybe it will start a discussion which will be a very meaningful discussion. But that is essential and normally in most self-respecting societies, and certainly in most sophisticated societies, it is the university which provides that space. It's the university where you can go and you can talk about anything, get clarifications, be refuted, have discussions, and come away, hopefully, uh, a better thinking person as a result. I mean, you have to have discussion and debate in order to think. So I think that it's very necessary, A, to recognize that there has been a tradition of debate and discussion in the past, that it's not just a case of here was a body of text which was passed on and like a package down the generations and it's still intact. No, here's a body of discussion that was passed on down the generations and we have to be familiar with that discussion. And today, we have to take that discussion on in a different kind of context. And it is very necessary uh, that there be a platform, a place, a location where people can go and discuss their ideas. I mean, and, and this is, let me, let me just add that in uh, the period of the, of the urbanization in the Ganga Valley, for example, around 500 BC or thereabouts, we're told that in the towns there was an area which was called the Kotu Halashala, literally the place for raising curiosity. And who was there in the Kotu Halashala? All these teachers, all these Shramana teachers would gather there, the Buddhists, the Jains, the Ajivakas, the this and the that, and they would hold discourses, public discourses, and people would come there and there would be debates. And what we really need in every university is a kotu halashala. <laughs> <laughs> On the one hand, we're talking about questions of um, where the relationship between history and mythology is being discussed. And uh, we're looking at history that has 
in, in a sense, not just as a discipline, but the imagination of people have become spaces of which are now, in one sense, um, a point of discussion or if in some sense even battle. In such a situation when the relationship between the right wing all over the world and conservative thought all over the world um, talks about uh, limiting the public imagination to certain things while asking the public to broaden its imagination when it comes to economic uh, expansion where it looks at neoliberalism as the model that needs to uh, that needs to be upheld by everybody. This contradiction in terms, so to speak, uh, the role it's playing in universities, we are now, um, we as students, we're able to see because uh, they're shutting down funding for universities, especially the humanities, and people are being pushed towards private universities. So how do you look at this relationship which appears to be a contradictory one. Well, it's, uh, it, c it can be made into a contradictory relationship. It doesn't have to be a contradictory relationship. In fact, in the best universities, it never is. Um, history is a target because a lot of our imagination goes into the making of history. I mean, we, we put onto history the imagined past, which can be anything. You can imagine anything and then say, oh yes, this is probably what, how, how it happened in history, which is, which is not so. Uh, where we are at now, I think, is a very interesting situation. Interesting is a very mild word. Um, that for the first time, uh, there is uh, a kind of coming together, forced and unforced of varieties of cultures and peoples at different levels of economic development who are being pushed into globalization and the neoliberal economy. Um, this is not always voluntary by any means. Uh, this is in many cases enforced, as one can see from the way in which people are reacting to it now. Uh, but what it means is a different understanding of um, the imagination of the past. And in a sense, I think it's being reflected in something which unfortunately our system of education, the people in, in charge of our education will never understand. It is being reflected in something that is being called big history. And all that big history means is that you have uh, the writing of the history across the world. You show the contacts across the world. And instead of the old-fashioned boxes that were civilizations, self-contained boxes where you had territory, language, religion, another territory, language, religion, uh, uh, Instead of that, you've got this kind of, you know, who was in touch with who, what were the ideas, what were the goods and images that were traveling. It's a different understanding of history. All right. Now, how does that relate to neoliberalism? It can be a very positive thing in the sense that I think the breaking down of these boxes of civilization and looking at contacts and communication and how people interacted with each other in the past is a very positive step. It's something we have to do in history. It has to come. But it's a question of, again, as is often the case, who controls this? Who controls what is being looked at? And who controls the end product of what is being suggested as being uh, the issues that were important and central to the development of a society or a culture or a people or whatever it may be. Uh, so there is that side to it. The other side, which I think is um, negative, very negative, that is the emphasis that is being put on science, technology, business management, and all of that as against humanities and social sciences. Now, I think that this kind of distinction that is being drawn uh, is disastrous. 
It's disastrous for the simple reason that knowledge is a whole. You cannot break it up and say, this is scientific knowledge, this has to progress, this is very good for us, this is technology, that's all right, this is uh, uh, business management, we need that. But all of this, liberal, uh, the, 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 the humanities and the social sciences are unimportant. And I gather that there are some vice chancellors who are being told, you know, uh, pay less attention to the social sciences, humanities, close them down as much as you can. The only thing that really matters is the sciences. Now, you know, one doesn't have to go back to what was written in the 1940s and 50s about the two cultures and so on. It's common sense that if you have an institution that is dealing with knowledge, and the advancement of knowledge. You have to have it completely open to every discipline that has any kind of meaning in that knowledge. Hmm? And where you start closing the disciplines or where you start behaving in a way in which people are not allowed to think openly on a discipline, you are affecting the whole of knowledge. And this is something which people who are not thinking about knowledge can't understand. They think that if you can close down this box and this box and this box, the other boxes will keep on growing. That is nonsense. The other boxes will also close down. And the danger therefore lies in the fact that if you attack the social sciences and the humanities and you say that, uh, that there is too much liberal thinking and there's too much open thinking and that they're being anti-national or they're being anti-this or anti-that, anti-religious or whatever it is, you are affecting in, if, in, in, in every way, you are affecting the whole business of the advance of knowledge in your country. And, and this is where it becomes much more serious than simply you have student unrest here and you put six people into jail and you have students. This, this is extremely important. This is, this is entirely unnecessary. This has to be tackled. But there is also the very basic danger that you're actually destroying knowledge. Thank you so much. <laughs>